Friends, I invite you to picture this scene. Oop, sorry, I do not. How can I go back? <laughs> right. I invite you to picture this scene. It's a 1970s South Africa, and a young girl is standing in a line holding her mother's hand. And we're among many parents and kids as we line up to enter the most innovative entertainment in my town, the Dome. And the Dome, the experience in the Dome, promises to blow our mind. Now, my mother is not a woman who enjoys having her mind blown. And embarrassingly, she taps on the shoulder of a woman in front of us and says, will you please hold Michelle's hand as she goes into the dome so that she remains safe and I don't have to go. And bless this woman, for she did hold my hand. And bless the dome, because it did blow my mind. The dome was a 180-degree movie being shown on a curved wall, and we were in the front row of a roller coaster. And I knew I was on static ground, but my body felt and responded like I was on a roller coaster. And I thought to myself, if this is possible, what else is possible? And friends, today I invite you to take my hand as we journey from that simple, semi-immersive experience of my youth to today's 360-degree, fully immersive experience that is virtual reality. I first got my personal dome when we were in lockdown and I assumed it would be for gaming. However, many of the games in VR are competitive, and I don't like having only one life. And I knew there were greater possibilities. So I joined a group of people called Educators in VR, and these are pioneers who are exploring how this immersive technology impacts on how we learn, how we develop skills, on our physical health and our bodies, and on some real human qualities like empathy. Research is showing us that experiences in VR are mapped on the body in the same way as a real lived experience. So in virtual reality, we are creating embedded memories. And the implications are huge. It makes this a real fertile ground for learning skills in an environment where it is safe to fail. So here are some use cases. Teachers can now take their students into science labs to feel what it might feel like to have a career in science. In high-risk environments like oil exploration or surgery, teams can develop skills before they go into the field. VR is making huge strides in healthcare. In the paraplegic population, for example, they've done studies that if this population can see their limbs moving, then their healing neurons fire quicker. I'd like to share with you some of my own personal use studies in VR. In a, an award-winning language app, Yo Practico Mi Español, with teachers who are trained to teach in VR and students from around the world, I have been to the most spectacular worlds. I have floated gravity-free on the US space station. I have sat among buffalo at a watering hole in Africa. I have danced, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a bit. I have sat at the feet of my favorite artists while they sing music just for me. And I was at the 2022 Beijing Olympics where no one else was allowed. 
However, the activity that, ah, no. Uh, this is my gym, and in here I box, and I paddleboard, and I do my yoga, but the activity that has really captured me is dance. This I filmed inside my dance studio. And for the last eight months, for an hour a day, I have danced in virtual reality. And I can attest to increased fitness, increased hand-eye coordination, increased ability to boogie, and a real impact on my moods. And I can dance alone, or I can, ah, I can dance in groups because VR has gone social. Because VR has gone social, improv is happening in VR. And we find training and we find improv groups. And so far, I have visited at least six theaters. This I captured inside VR, and it's a whose line is it anyway theater. So exciting stuff on the improv front. And it's important if we're going to talk about VR and social to talk about the avatars that we choose. These are the characters that we say yes to in VR. And we can create a character who has a likeness of our own or somebody very, very different from us. And studies are now revealing that there is a relationship between how that avatar shows up in the real life and how, or how the avatar shows up in VR and how we show up in real life. And we see increased confidence levels, increased risk-taking tendency, and increased empathetic expression because of these memories that we are making in VR. I wanted to put on the headset today, but I can't because of the mic. I wanted to do, demonstrate to you that I can put on the headset and I can now walk around the stage without fear of falling off, which I could not do eight months ago because those engineers and inventors and innovative innovators behind VR are particularly safety conscious and are ensuring that there's this amazing safe experience for us all. I no longer need to hold anybody's hand to feel safe in VR because of that reason. And for the past several months, I have been contemplating this question. What can we, as applied improvisers, and applied improv facilitators, what can we learn from VR? And I don't think I have found a definitive answer. Because while this technology is safe and is about worlds and characters and is amazing, this technology that we all do is also about worlds and safety and characters and it's amazing. And I wonder what might be possible if we enter into a conversation to see what we can learn from these two technologies put together. And so I have my VR with me, as you see, and I offer you an open invitation. If anybody is interested to visit some of the worlds, to dance in some of the studios, come and talk to me, and perhaps we can open up this conversation between us. If this is possible, what else is possible? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And thank God for the VR technology and especially Beat Saber because before Beat Saber I knew I have no rhythm, but now I have a, a very uh, specific high score to tell me I don't have any rhythm. Next one, I invite on stage Laura Berkmeyer. And she, talk, uh, she will talk about us about the effects of improvisational theater. So give her the warmest applause. <laughs> This room is so full of knowledge, and I'm so happy standing here presenting you some data so we can all use this knowledge to do something with this data. I'm Laura Berkemeyer, I'm an improviser, but I'm also a scientist in the field of working psychology and looking what people can learn from different things, like also free time activities. So I want to show you what is the power of improvisational theater especially regarding creative self-efficacy and self-esteem. Before I start, I um, invite you to close your eyes and think of the first time 
you ever did improvised theater. Remember the room you were in, the smell which might be there. Remember those people who were there. And remember what was the feeling after your first impression of improvisational theater. Now, open your eyes and I give you a short moment to share your experience with your neighbor. All right, I gently invite you to come back to this room. Now you have an amazing topic to talk about in the next break, because I think there's a lot we can talk about starting improv. So, um, I said I'm also an improv teacher, and um, from a lot of students I get sentences like, improv changed my life, or I feel more confident now. But I'm also a scientist, so anecdotes are not enough for me. I want to have data that shows that this stuff is happening. So for a really untypical presentation, I start with my results. So um, uh, participants, <laughs> <laughs> participants who are starting to play improv as a free time activity have higher creative self-efficacy and self-esteem and also higher growth compared to sports control group over time. But how did I get these results? I will take you on that journey. So what did we measure? We measured first self-esteem. This is a combination of emotional states and cognitive beliefs. So what is my own worth and my evaluation of worth? So the idea is that when we play improv, we have this positive social interactions with the other people in the room. Um, and we also have a fulfillment of compet uh, competency and mastery. And there's also trainers supporting us all the time that we will succeed, that we are allowed to make errors, that we can grow in doing that. The other thing is creative self-efficacy. That's the belief that I have the ability to pr produce creative outcomes. So the idea is to increase this self-efficacy, you need to learn about rules and train strategies to do that. And what do we do in improv? We do that all the time with nearly all the exercises. How did we measure that? That was a difficult way to do that. So at the beginning, we had personal questions, and then we asked a lot of German and uh, 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 Switzerland improv schools um, to send their questionnaires out to people starting their uh, improv classes. It was a huge project, and a lot of people participated, and I'm really thankful for that. And then uh, the second, fourth, and sixth training, before and after the training, they answered a questionnaire regarding the different questions. So, this is, I hope you got that because it's a, it's a little bit complicated. It was also complicated for the participants, but it was important to see the changes bef between before and, be uh, and after, but also over time. Who did we measure? In total, we had 104 participants uh, regarding improvisation and 98 participants training sports during that time. Thank you very much, that was a lot of work. Um, yeah, the, all of them were working, so it was all people working and doing sports or improv during their free time. So now I have the results in easy graphic ways. If you're a scientist and more interested in all the data stuff behind it, please come to me and ask. I try to make it as easy as possible, but still scientific correct. Yeah, <laughs> so um, here we see that uh, improv before and that improv after. And the scale is significant, but the scale, scale is still quite close. As you see, it comes from 3.3 .3 to 3.5. It's not super much, but it's just three, uh, like six trainings, and that's it. So I think that's still amazing that you can see that it's growing. 
If we compare that to the people doing sports, we see their self-esteem from the beginning was higher, but the uh, improv people group reached the self-esteem of the sports group. The same happened, um, I have all the slides, you don't have to take pictures, you will get all the slides. Everyone who wants to have the slides can have the slides. Um, the same happened with self, uh, creative self-efficacy, so it was also um, growing, and then if you compare it to the sports group, the sports group are the blue ones, you can see the red one, the improv after, was um, growing higher. Also, I measured positive effect, like how do I feel activated, uh, strong, whatever, and you can see it was rising quite well from before to after the uh, training. It was the same in the sport group as well. So it's just good to do improv, especially after work, helps us with our positive effect. Another thing, learning from errors. It's a big thing uh, we also do when we train improv, embrace our mistakes, what can we learn from errors instead of hating ourselves to do errors. So this uh, also grow over the weeks uh, quite high um, learning from errors. But I'm a scientist, as I said, so there's some discussion and some limitation to that study, obviously. Um, so first of all, it was nice. It was an improv intervention, and we decided not to take a waiting control list group, so people who did nothing during that time, but we proved that compared to people who are actively doing something, which is quite well proven doing sports, that improv showed even effects above that by having higher growth curves. Um, however, they should be discussed, is there a learning plateau? Can it just be because people did something new? It could also be something else, something new they did. They just learned more than other people. Uh, might the effect also happen if we learn dancing or whatever? Um, it was also a field study, so it was beginner's classes of a lot of different schools in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing. It was like starting to learn improv principles of yes and and acceptance, but it was not a manualized uh, study. But at least it's one of the studies with the most participants yet in improv theater. So both sides. And as there are scientists here in the room, there are some ideas for future studies. So it uh, might be interesting to look at the development. This was only for six weeks. What happens if it's for a longer time? What happens if we do it for a shorter time? What happens if we do it more in applied improvisation and not in the free time activities? And um, also uh, examining individual exercises. What does this exercise actually happen? What happens within people when doing this? So there's way more research we can do and we should do. Uh, thank you very much and keep in touch. Woo! Thank you, Laura. And to finish this lightning round of presentations, I give you... What? The last the la can we go one slide back? Then you have to just live with it. Yeah. I give you Joris Rolovs to talk about a bit about improv and politics. Hey. Thank you very much. Let me try this thing real quick. Thank you very much for your attention. In 1863, a young Friedrich Nietzsche wrote to his mother and sister and told them about something he experienced at school the day before. Yesterday, an improviser, Professor Biermann, entertained us for an hour in an excellent manner. We gave him themes, one of which was particularly agreeable on the difficult learning of mathematics, which he executed quite marvelously. But what is that to improvise? And so, I'll get back to this improviser, Beermann guy. Uh, first, I would like to look more, more closely to Nietzsche's question, what is that to improvise? Aber was ist das doch improvisieren? There's many ways of answering this question, but today I would like to focus on the historical background of the term, and then from there, segue into some of its political dimensions. There's many ways, as I said, to define improvisation. 
Uh, you can improvise anything from dinner to an escape, an escape tool. <laughs> Remember MacGyver, right? <laughs> to a jazz trumpet solo. This is probably a very good tr jazz trumpet solo because it's Miles Davis. However, if we look at the actual the term improvisation and improvise, it's interesting to look at the Italian verb improvisare, which actually meant the art of spontaneous impromptu verse making. Uh, and that, that was later then also used in the context of theater and commedia dell'arte in particular, which by the way or originally was called commedia all'improvviso. Now, and then the term improviser, or in German, improvisator, it's interesting to look at the Italian term improvisatore for a male improviser, or improvisatrice for a female improviser. This term denoted poetic improvisers, so poetry improvisers who would perform publicly and would compose verses based on the themes given to them by the audience. Now, because Northern European writers started to write about these improvisers, uh, here on the left, by the way, we see uh, improvisatore Tommaso Scricci. On the right, we see Corella Olimpica. And Corella Olimpica would actually then turn out to be the main source of inspiration for Madame de Staël's Corinne ou l'Italie, written and in French in 1807 and translated into English in 1807 as well. This novel was based on a female improviser, improvisatrice Corinne, uh, and actually introduced the English public with the improvisation terminology and the phenomenon. So in a way, when we say that we are improvising a salad dressing, we are still unconsciously referring back to this improvisation, improvisatory tradition. Back to Nietzsche. So this improviser, Biermann, as it turns out, was a German, kind of a German version of these improvisatori, these poetry improvisers. And I did a little research on Biermann, and I found this poster from 1857, which really talks about, which invites audience members to indeed propose themes for the improvisation. And I was particularly interested by this little highlighted disclaimer, which tells us that all religion, <laughs> politics, and personality-related themes cannot be accepted. So here's my segue into the political dimension of improvisation. In fact, if you go back to the Dutch, my country, the Dutch parliamentary archives, and you do key searches, if you have time on your hands, and you do key searches uh, on improvisation, we'll find that it's been used there too, especially mid-19, early 19th century. Well, the problem with improvisation and the blessing of improvisation is that improvisations cannot be read. Um, you can't read improvisations, which is really annoying for an improvisa improvisation researcher. <laughs> but it's even more annoying for those who would really like to control the outcome of improvisational performances, political authorities and censors. Which brings me to German-speaking improvisational theater in the 18th century, uh, and in particular this character on the left, which you might recognize from the very beginning, called Hans Wurst, kind of a, a lustige figure, a funny figure, very improvisational figure. And many wanted to get rid of Hans Wurst in particular and of improvisation in general. Most vociferous, a most vociferous voice against Hans Wurst and improvisation was the political scientist Joseph von Sonnefels, who was vociferously opposed to the death penalty, to torture, and to improvisation. <laughs> in, an essay, in an essay called On the Necessity to Ban Improvisation, 
He wondered why on earth a writer who thinks before he writes stuff down, who consults friends before he publishes it, why he should go through censorship, whereas an actor who appears at the stage on stage without preparation should be allowed to throw the first thing that comes to their lips out into the open. So he begs the Emperor Joseph II to do away with improvisation for once and for all. And indeed, to Joseph II, to a large part, grants Joseph von Sonnefels's request. This is 1770. It shall be strictly forbidden for play actors to engage in any deliberate adding, varying, or off-the-cuff speaking to the audience without prior approval by censorship, with the threat that, in case of the first violation, such an actor or actress shall be placed under arrest for 24 hours immediately after the performance, and in case of a second violation, he or she shall be mercilessly removed from the theater. Now, what happened is that policemen indeed showed up at rehearsals and performances with the approved text in their hand and were checking whether or not the, the actors stuck to the approved text or deviated from it. This anti-improvisation policy only intensified after the French Revolution when improvisers could indeed end up in jail. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Joris. Thank you all. Um, and also, we'd like to extend uh, our thank you to Philip Elika Sabe, who's the one who's doing the visual recording. Hey.